than the larger universities also. So sometimes the advantages of a small school is you might know your professors better, you might recognize more people walking the corridors of the big buildings, uh, but you also may not have as many course offerings as you would at a larger university. On the other hand, the larger university might not be able to get into some of those courses as underclassmen. Very often they are credit bearing and um, credit based. So the more credits you have coming in, the better your chances are getting into a class. A large university will have smaller recitation groups in addition to a larger lecture hall. So if you have a class of 250 people, you might have a discussion group of say 15 to 20 that meets once a week to have that larger experience feel more intimate. So I talked about location, I talked about size of school. Something else to consider when looking at universities is what I think the most important thing is the academic experience. You're going to college not to rush a fraternity. You're going to college not to join an extracurricular activity. The main reason you're going to college is for an education. You're paying the tuition box for a great, great academic experience. Everything else is icing on the cake. So if you want to go to a school that doesn't have the academic offerings you're seeking, you're in the wrong place. When I used to work at NYU, I can't tell you how many people would say, I want to go to NYU and study fashion. I said, okay, it's great you want to go to NYU, we don't offer fashion. Or I heard someone say to me this year that she wants to go to Cooper Union to study creative writing. Not possible. Cooper Union has engineering, art, and architecture. So the idea is that when you are looking into a school, you want to make sure that the academic fit makes sense. So you want to look to see if there is general liberal arts or if there's a certain pre-professional track that you're considering. Like I mentioned before, engineering or nursing or business. These types of things are important to consider because if you want to go to a school that doesn't have engineering and you want to study engineering, you're in the wrong place. A lot of schools, they will say, we have a very strong biology program. We have a very strong English program, history. And that's because those are very subscribed majors. If you want to go into general liberal arts, you'll probably get a great education in those departments wherever you go. But if you want something more specialized, then the school that you're considering uh, will really have to have the academic offerings you're seeking. Also, when you're looking into academics, you want to look into the core curricular requirements. Some schools might have something like a very rigid core. Columbia is known for that. University of Chicago is known for that. Other schools might have more general education distribution requirements. University of Pennsylvania, Harvard. And the idea is that some schools like Brown will have no core requirements. So you want to be able to see what the requirements are before delving into a major. For some schools, it might feel more exorbitant. For other schools, it might feel like it's not enough. Then you have schools that might be on the quarter system, University of Chicago, Dartmouth, uh, Stanford, UCLA, Northwestern. These are examples of schools that instead of two semesters fall and winter, will typically have a fall, a winter, and a spring quarter with an optional summer quarter. So instead of 15 week semesters, you have 10 week quarters. So what that means is you might have more essays, midterms, and finals over the course of the school year than in a semester-based school. So if you're someone who works with that type of energy, that's great. If you're someone who only studies last minute for a midterm or a final, to have an extra added trimester is not going to be easy. So the academic considerations are huge. You also want to consider the schools and the student organizations. If you're someone who's looking for a certain type of diversity, look to see what the student clubs are related to that form of diversity. If you're someone who's looking for a school with a big athletic program in Division I, then certain big name D3 schools aren't going to satisfy you. So these are types of things you want to consider also, but first and foremost is going to be academics. So now what I'm gonna do is talk about the admission process and what does it look like as someone applying, whether you're a senior or you're currently a junior looking. So the most important thing that colleges care about is the transcript. The transcript is your collection of courses and grades, courses over the course of four years of high school, grades over the course of the first three years. If you apply anywhere early, I'll talk about notification plans like early decision or early action. They can ask for first quarter grades. Then regular decision, they can ask for first semester grades. Wherever you're ultimately going to deposit and matriculate, that school will get your final, final grades. So something to consider when it comes to your transcript is curricular rigor. How strong is the program that you're taking? If you're trying to apply to a school that's very highly selective, and your high schools offer AP or IB or honors classes, they're expecting you to take as many of those as you can. So for example, someone just typed in the word MIT. MIT is expecting the highest level of math and science through four years of college, high school in order to be competitive in their applicant pool. And when it comes to the idea of a highly selective school, they're looking for not just the curricular rigor, but also the strongest grades possible. So a highly selective school, anything in the Ivy League, Stanford, Duke, U Chicago, Johns Hopkins, MIT, Caltech, these types of schools are expecting A's across the board. If you have an A minus, that doesn't mean you're not getting in. 
but you can't have a whole series of A minuses or B pluses. They're looking for the strongest of the strongest. When it comes to the transcript, they're looking for curricular rigor, they're looking for the grades, they're looking at every school individually. So they know that different schools have different systems. Some schools have a letter grade, like A's. Some schools have numeric, like they said, 100. So whatever it is that your school has to offer, that's what they're looking into. Someone here asked about what does undergraduate versus graduate mean? Just so you know, undergraduate means college, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior years. And graduate means beyond college, going for a master's degree or a medical degree or a law degree. So when it comes to the transcript, it's important to know that you do want to do the best you can at the start of high school. Plenty of schools will admit you if you don't have straight A's. Um, but when it comes to the more competitive schools, they're looking for as strong of a transcript as possible. They do note upward trends. Maybe you struggled freshman year, you did a lot better sophomore year, and you knocked it out of the park junior year. They note any life circumstances. Maybe your sophomore year, you had surgery and you were out of school for two months and your grades suffered. I see that every year at my school. Obviously, everyone has a life adversity now with coronavirus. So they're not looking at that as an excuse unless it really impacted you and your family. So you can't say, add coronavirus, I didn't do as well. That's something that everyone's facing. But if there's something compelling that happens to your family and you want to elaborate on that in the application, you could definitely do that. I mentioned the idea of applying early before. It's important to talk about what are these terms. Does anyone here know what early decision is? Feel free to unmute yourself and tell us all what early decision means. Okay, I guess not. So early decision is a decision plan where you can apply to a school by November 1st. And if offered admission, you'll find out mid-December and you withdraw all your other applications that you might have pending. Early decision tends to be private schools. So if you think of any private schools, whether they're in the Ivy League, non-Ivy League, very often they'll have early decision that gives you a better chance of getting into that school. So early decision is a November 1st deadline. You'll find out mid-December, it could be an admit, it could be a deferral, which means they wanna look at you in the regular decision pool, or it could be a denial. You might hear a term called early decision two over the next couple of years. Early decision two is for students who wanna to apply to a second choice school. So they apply by January 1st, because maybe they didn't get in elsewhere in early decision, or maybe they just weren't ready to commit to a school by November 1st. So early decision two means you apply by January 1st, you find that mid-February, as opposed to late March when regular decision notifies. And if admitted, you withdraw all your other applications. So whether you do early decision one or early decision two, you're basically saying, this is my top choice school. If admitted, I want to come here. And that means that you have to do financial aid research beforehand. You have to do a lot of research on your own about the college itself to see if it's the right place for you. The chances in early decision are definitely stronger than regular decision. So what that means is that a school like NYU, just to give an example, is taking about 60% of their class through ED1 and ED2. Doesn't mean a 60% admission rate, just means 60% of the incoming freshmen come from ED1 and ED2. And ED1 is the acronym for Early Decision 1 and ED2 for Early Decision 2. Does anyone here know what early action is? Feel free to call it out or type it in. Okay, so early action, tends to be state schools. So it's the public institutions who are giving you an earlier date when you can apply, but if offered admission, you're not bound to go there. So what that means is that you still have until May 1st to weigh all your options and determine if you want to go to that school. Early action will include more, more selective public institutions and less selective. So you'll see Rutgers, you'll see Binghamton, you'll see University of Illinois, you'll see uh, University of Maryland, you'll see uh, University of Vermont, all having early action deadlines. If you're applying to a state school, especially as an out-of-state student, you really need to hit that November 1st deadline. Applying after, your chances go down considerably. For example, Michigan, if you don't hit their early deadline as an out-of-stater, your chances are really slim to none a day later if you get it in after the deadline. So that's something to think about. Deadlines are really important, important for the college admission process. Another term to take into consideration is restrictive early action. So you heard of early decision, you heard of early decision too, and you heard of early action. Restrictive early action is something unique to Harvard, Yale, Princeton, and Stanford. Actually, Princeton's getting rid of it this year because of coronavirus, but Harvard, Yale, and Stanford still have it. Restrictive early action means you apply to that school by November 1st, but if admitted, you're not bound to go there. However, you cannot do a restrictive early action and an early decision. So you can't do a Harvard restrictive early action and Dartmouth early decision. 
if a school is regular early action, not restrictive early action, like Michigan, Wisconsin, Maryland, you could do that and an early decision. But if admitted to the early decision school, you'd have to withdraw the early action application. So let me give you an example. Early action means you're dating. You wanna date multiple people at a time, that's okay. Early decision means you're ready to get married. You're committing to one person. So let's say you wanna do an application to Barnard College. You could do an early decision application to Barnard, and you could do multiple early actions. So you could do Binghamton, SUNY Albany, SUNY Buffalo. But if admitted to Barnard, you're going to withdraw those early action applications. Okay? So the other deadline you might hear about is rolling admission. Not as many schools have that as they used to. Rolling admission means the earlier you apply, the better your chances, and the application numbers fill up as the year progresses. So with early action schools, you want to get in your application sooner rather than later. Regular decision is the applicant pool that most people apply to the January 1st deadline. You find out late March. So I talked about uh, transcript. I want to talk about now standardized testing. So that's probably the second most important. For this year's rising seniors, it might not be as important. A lot of schools are test optional. For those of you who are rising juniors, sophomores, and freshmen, um, as long as test centers are going to be open this school year, the testing will likely be back on the radar. Standardized testing includes SAT and ACT as the two most important. A student should submit one or the other, doesn't matter which one. In addition, there's also SAT subject tests. There's AP exams. There are um, the international baccalaureate exams. So SAT, ACT for a lot of schools is a major, major measurement to go alongside the transcript. So SAT is out of 1600. Two sections are evidence-based reading and writing and mathematics, each are 800. And the ACT is out of a 36. It measures English, math, reading, and science. Each one is out of 36. And then there's a new composite based on the average of those four scores. So how it works for SAT is there are different months when you can take it, and you need to take it prior to a deadline of any school you're applying to. ACT also has different months when you can take it. If anyone here is a rising senior and hasn't been able to test yet, it's not your fault. Um, everything has been shut down so far, and that's why a lot of colleges have gone test optional. However, if you have very strong scores and you're applying to colleges this year, that can only help you out, especially since a lot of the pool is going to not have testing. SAT subject tests is another form of testing that used to be required, then became heavily recommended by the more competitive schools. Now it's not as popular because of coronavirus. It might make a comeback in the future. And subject tests demonstrate proficiency in subjects where maybe you took an AP or an honors level class and it's out of 800 and you could showcase mid 700s or higher scores to help buttress your applications. So SAT subject tests, the recommendation is to do two at least. If you're applying for engineering, they like to see math and science, with math preferably being the math two, which is more advanced than math one and science being chemistry and or physics. So when it comes to standardized testing, the APs, for example, it's more important to do well in your actual AP course, getting an A, than it is to get a four or five. However, if you get a four or five, that can very much look good for you. And also it's very important for advising purposes to get credits as an incoming freshman so you have advanced standing credit. When it comes to the next parts of the application, they're not as important as transcript and testing. Transcript and testing is basically like the uh, the chips to play poker. It's the cards you need to be at the table. And then everything else will come into place. So let's talk about extracurricular activities. When you're applying to colleges, looking to see that you're someone who's been involved in activities with either multi-year commitments, multiple hours per week and weeks per year, and not something you just did ninth grade for an hour. Not something you just picked up in your senior year for the first time. Yes, coronavirus has definitely changed the landscape of what extracurriculars look like. So they're gonna focus more on what you've done before uh, coronavirus. And also if you've done anything during coronavirus, maybe you picked up an instrument, maybe you started reading a ton of books and you wanna write about that. Maybe you're doing some type of community service where you're reaching out to senior citizens and nursing homes and having Zoom calls with them. There are things you could do even during COVID-19 that will entail social distancing and being safe. There is no one extracurricular that gets you into college. However, they like to see that there is some type of commitment. So whether it is athletics, whether it is drama society, choir, um, community service organizations, academic clubs, these are types of things they're looking for. For the most selective schools, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Columbia, Stanford, uh, Penn, they're looking for separation factor. 
what is it you have that other people in the pool don't have? That is hard for a high school student, but that's something you need to figure out. So the idea is that it's not just you're in 10 different clubs and you're a leader of 10 different clubs, but also what do you have that's unique about you that gives you some separation? So for example, I have a student who is very into going to all different nursing homes and teaching the technology of Zoom, of FaceTime, to uh, the senior citizens there. That's something that's pretty unique and compelling. I have a student who read to um, domestic abuse victims at a homeless shelter every single week. That's unique. So the idea is, what is that separation factor? Colleges aren't looking for community service that you're doing in Europe or Asia. They're looking for community service that you're engaged with here in New York City. So the idea is that they want to see that you care about your community, not that you spent $6,000 to fly somewhere exotic to make it seem like you want to get involved in service there. If you've done that, that's amazing, but I don't want you to feel like that's the in to colleges. After extracurriculars, we could talk about essays. So colleges will look at one main essay that'll work for the Common App and the Coalition App. The Common App is an application vehicle that a lot of colleges use. The Coalition App is a competitor vehicle that some schools that are on Coalition don't use Common App. And then there are schools like CUNY, also Macaulay Honors, that use their own individual school's application. So when it comes to the essay, the essay is the part where you're gonna showcase a side of yourself that maybe they wouldn't see elsewhere in the application. It's not where you're doing a resume rewrite. They don't wanna see first paragraph, I did theater. Second paragraph, I did key club. Third paragraph, I did basketball, and here's my conclusion. That's not what they're looking for. They're looking for one type of vignette, one type of story that's gonna really showcase you, the side of you that maybe they wanna know about because you'll make a great roommate, or you'll make a great pupil in the classroom. They're looking to see your compelling writing ability. You need to have that opening sentence that draws them in and that really strong first paragraph that's a hook for the rest of the essay. Admission officers read tons of essays. You don't want them to skim yours. You want them to read yours. So make sure you really have a compelling opening to have them lead into the rest of the essay. You guys are used to writing essays based on English class with an intro, body paragraphs, conclusion. College essays, you could take a risk. You actually don't have to feel like you have to have supporting evidence and proofs. It's not like that with college essay writing. It's more like a memoir where you're telling your story in under 650 words. In addition to a main essay, a lot of schools, especially the more competitive ones, will have supplemental essays. And these are unique to each school. It might be, why do you want to go to X university? Why do you want to study Y at this university? Uh, tell us about your background and what we can learn about you. So it's very different from a main common app essay where there are pointed questions. You can also do topic of your choice. But when it comes to supplemental essay, they're looking to see the match that you are for a school. So for example, Columbia wants to know just how intellectual you are when you're applying to the, the university because the core curriculum is so all encompassing. So one of their questions will be, list all the books you've read for pleasure this past year. If that list is empty, you do not belong at Columbia. They're expecting you to read and read and read because that's what their core entails. And if you're gonna list one of your academic majors as economics, as an example, they're expecting you to read books about economics during your high school career. So these are things to consider. You wanna be a good match for a school. I once had a student say to me, I don't like to read, but what do I write for the application? I said, if you don't like to read, you're not gonna like Columbia. So the idea is that yes, Columbia sounds like an elite school and it's something that's gonna impress employers one day at graduate schools, but not if you're gonna get all C's because you're not a strong reader who can read a book a week. So you have to think about that consideration. In addition to essays, recommendation letters are a very important part of the process. Recommendation letters, you wanna get two from in-classroom teachers. So that could be English, history, math, science, and foreign language. So yes, you might have some other teachers in classes like journalism or physical education or art. Those are nice, but they really prefer the academic majors. So English, history, math, science, foreign language. The idea is that you should have two from junior year or one sophomore year, one junior year. So when it comes to recommendation letters, you wanna ask the teachers whom you've gotten to know pretty well and they know you. Maybe it's a class where you excelled in throughout or a class where maybe you got a B plus first semester but an A plus second semester. It's a class where you participate, where if there's group work, you're one of those leaders, where you've always done well with your writing, for example. So try to think of those teachers with whom you're developing the rapport. And it has to be an in-classroom recommendation letter. In addition, you'll also get a school official, which will either be a college counselor, maybe an associate principal, someone who will write about you on the macro level. So the teacher covers the micro, how you are in that class. 
and the macro is the school official who's covering your personality. So a lot of these school officials will require you to submit questionnaires of some kinds, where you're gonna write about yourself more so that the writer knows more about you. There might be parent forms to fill out. So parents, do a great job filling out those forms as well to help buttress the recommendation letter for your kids. Sometimes students wanna have supplemental recommendation letters. Colleges really don't care about those. <clears throat> if you feel like you have a coach who you know very well and you're applying to a school you might be a recruited athlete, sure, you should get that coach's letter. Or if you've done summer research with a hospital and your supervisor can really attest to your breakthroughs, sure, you can have that. That doesn't replace the two teacher letters and the school official that could add on to it, but you shouldn't feel like you have to ask 10 different people for 10 different letters. They're not looking for that at all. Next is the interview. Most public schools do not give interviews. Most private schools, the interview is optional. The interview really can hurt someone more than it could help someone. A really poor interview can be damaging. So a really poor interview can be if you come across as someone who will be dangerous on campus or someone who is not gonna be tolerant of other people's views or someone who's not open to diversity both domestically and internationally or someone who is not understanding of the other opinion. So it's important the interview you come across as not someone who's just sophisticated and someone who has a lot to express, but someone who's really gonna be a decent human being on campus. That's pretty important. A really strong interview is another nice piece that goes in your application. It doesn't make up for a much lower test score or a much lower GPA, but it can be another piece to add to your file. A really weak interview can hurt. For interviews, you need to be on top of the schools that you're considering and what their process is. So for example, Barnard College starts interviews in the summer before senior year, and those fill up. So you have to know to do that right away and schedule those. Whereas other schools like Columbia, which is across the street from Barnard, you can't request an interview. It's after you apply, they'll reach out to you if they want you to interview. So look at any university's admission webpage to see what the interview protocol is like to be sure you're on top of that part of the admission process. <laughs> Finally, there are other miscellaneous factors such as if you're a recruited athlete, you represent a certain type of diversity a school's looking for, maybe you're playing in the marching band, uh, maybe you have a unique major that is undersubscribed, like classics, for example, and you can prove that in your application as a major of interest. So these are different types of things that are miscellaneous, in addition to everything else I mentioned before. I see that there are a lot of questions here in the chat. I'm happy to go over the questions. And of course, if you have more questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, There's a question about New York City Public High Schools Institute of Policy, where you can choose to have your final grade from June converted from a number to essentially a pass with credit grade. It's my understanding the pass grade will not factor into your GPA. How would an admission officer judge me? This is a great question. A lot of high schools went pass fail. A lot of high schools gave letter grades. A lot of high schools gave a student a choice what they want to do. If a school went pass fail, the student will never be penalized for only having P's on their transcript. If a school does pass fail, but allows you to choose which grades you want, it might not look as good if you have five grades and then three passes. So you have to be careful what you want to do. Um, if a school has pure letter grades, then that's, that's the case. I would say the only reason to do a pass as opposed to a letter grade, if given the choice, is if you have a below a B. If you have an 85 average or a B average, I wouldn't put pass instead of that. So that's something to consider. Um, next question I have here. Do you lose financial aid discount leverage with early decision action? That's a great question. With early action, absolutely not. Early action is non-binding. For early decision, what's important to know is that prior to applying, families need to do research on what the financial parameters will look like for that school where they're considering committing. So I want you to take this information down, parents especially. There's something called a net price calculator on every university's website. A net price calculator is something you can look at prior to applying to get a sense of what a financial aid package could look like based on income figures from the prior year. So right now, this October 2020, if anyone's considering an early decision application, parents can plug in their income figures from 2019 and get a sense of what a financial aid package could look like if admitted early decision. Now, colleges are very onto the fact that parents might have different income one year to the next, especially this year, 2020, a lot of parents might have much lower income if they lost their jobs or if they're working in a field where they're counting on more human interaction. So it's important to know that prior to applying, you can also have a conversation with a financial aid, uh, financial aid officer. 
they are human beings. They are not robots creating calculations. And if there's a story to tell, they will give that opinion of how to best guide you if early decision makes sense. If you need to compare multiple financial aid packages from state schools, out-of-state schools, private schools, early decision does not allow you to do that. Early decision means if offered a mission, you're gonna go. The only reason not to go is if you're expecting a certain package based on that price calculator and they gave you significantly less money. Next question. If AP is a five, do we need to take the subject test? That's a great question. AP scores don't matter as much as subject test scores when it comes to the admission process. AP scores matter more with advising and being given advanced credits. So let's say you're someone who got a five in AP bio, take that bio subject test. But you're never gonna know you got that five because that five comes out in July. So what you should be doing is registering for subject tests for June, if you're a rising junior, for example, for June of next year. If you're a rising senior, don't worry about subject tests as much. If you already got a five, you're good to go. Do colleges value some subject grades higher than others, such as math over foreign language? Great question. Colleges prioritize English, history, math, science, foreign language. They consider those the academic majors. If you're applying to an engineering school, they'll look at math, science with a little bit more distinction than English, history, and foreign language. They still care a lot about English, history, and foreign language, but the most important feature to them is gonna be math and science. If you're thinking of a business school, math is also important. So that's a great question. If you have lower grades in other subjects, those don't look good. No one should have a 72 in driver's ed. Uh, no one should have a 75 in phys ed, but those aren't gonna matter as much as the academic majors. How will the value of essays and standardized tests such as SAT change due to COVID? Great question. So colleges don't wanna see a bunch of essays that are COVID related. There's actually gonna be a coronavirus section specific to this year's applicant pool of how they are impacted by corona. So the essay writing is gonna be very important, but you should have a story to tell based on two and a half years of high school, not just based on this, the fourth quarter, essentially, of junior year. Standardized testing for rising seniors won't be as much of a consideration if you don't have it. However, if you do have very high scores, that can only help yourself out. You can also take a test and have score choice, which means you can determine not to send those scores. So when registering for an SAT or ACT, it might say, you can send the scores to schools for free, choose four schools. Don't send it for free. <laughs> Save yourself the score choice feature and decide once you know where you're applying, which scores you're gonna send. Next, does it really matter what year your teacher is? Say I made a really great connection with my freshman teacher in a subject that I wanna study in college. How would that be perceived? It really matters. They don't think a freshman in high school is the same preparation as someone who's a junior in high school. They're looking to see what your level of engagement is to showcase that you're ready for college. So I'm really happy of great freshman teachers. Maybe you have a freshman teacher again, junior year, that's wonderful. But they really wanna see someone from junior year or if you need to, one from sophomore year. Next question. If you took an AP course freshman year, is asking for a rec from that teacher look bad? Doesn't look as good as an AP from sophomore or junior year. Okay. Next, I have a high GPA, but did not take any AP classes. Would that hinder me from getting into a good college? You would still will get into a really good college. If you're looking for the most highly selective schools, they're expecting you to maximize the curriculum of what your school has to offer. The school where I work, for example, a student can take a maximum of four APs. So any of my top students who are in the top honors classes the first couple of years will all be taking four APs, either one junior year, three senior year, or two junior year, two senior year. The idea is that they're expecting you to have the most rigorous curriculum based on what your school has to offer. Question of, do colleges look at volunteer versus internships differently? There's no quality ranking to the extracurricular. I would say volunteerism is impressive. I would say internships are impressive. But not everyone has access to internships, whereas everyone has access to volunteerism. So I don't want them to feel like if they had an internship, that's their in above kids that did it. Colleges also recognize that maybe your family had connections or maybe uh, your school had connections in a way that someone seeking out community service didn't need a connection to establish that. I would tell students all the time, I think the most impressive thing for a summer is getting a job and making money and maybe using that money to support your family or using that money to support your college allowance. So it's just as impressive to be a busboy in a restaurant or an usher in a movie theater as it is to intern at a hedge fund. Something to keep in mind. Um, next question about dealing with some hardships during COVID. Some grades may have dropped from my classes. Um, compensate by taking regions. So here's something to think about. Anything that happened to you and your family during COVID-19 
is explainable on the common application. It shouldn't just be, I was stressed because of COVID. Maybe something happened. Maybe you yourself got sick or parents got sick or you lost a grandparent or an uncle. This is very real and colleges know that. They're not gonna penalize you if COVID ravaged your family, but they all wanna see that you're explaining it. They're not gonna know unless you explain it. If you wanna take certain exams in January, you can. I don't know if it's required, Francis. You know if Regents in January is going to be required for any certain subject. They haven't. They haven't announced anything just yet. Um, at the current moment, there's no August Regents, and there's no. Um, there was no June Regents, but th there hasn't been an official announcement. We do encourage kids to study and prepare the Regents content for the purposes of the SAT, PSAT, and ACT. I can elaborate more on that um, when you're done, but. I mean, the content will be necessary. Um, the exact dates, nothing has been announced yet by the regions. Got it, thank you. Question about school doesn't offer AP, is that a detriment? The answer is no. I know plenty of private schools, for example, that got rid of APs years ago. So if those schools have honors as the classes that are the highest level, that is more than okay. A lot of schools have international baccalaureate. A lot of schools have dual enrollment with colleges. So whatever the curriculum is that a school has, no one's gonna be penalized we're not going above the highest level that the school has to offer. Question about is good GPA freshman and sophomore year, junior year struggles, but down a little bit, but one semester affect me a lot. So junior year in general is an important year. It's a pivotal year. With coronavirus changing things second semester, you know, it, it looks a little different, but if you just struggle first semester and did better second semester, that is impressive. And that's something you can write about in the additional information. How is number grade converted to GPA? So every school has their own unique formula. Typically, 4.0 is A, so that's like the 90s, high, mid to high 90s. Uh, 3.6666 is A minus, so that's low 90s, 90 to 92. Um, 3.3333 is gonna be B plus, let's say 87 to 89, et cetera, down the line. Um, how good is science research in applying to BSMD and pre-med programs? Okay, so let's talk. Pre-med is not a track you have to list in your application. Pre-med is something you could do once you're in that college. So pre-med is an advising track that includes one year of bio, chem, organic chemistry, and physics with a semester of calculus. You don't have to write pre-med on an application. You could do pre-med once you're in school. If you list a certain application, it could be more competitive at that school and it doesn't necessarily help you. So if you're gonna say pre-med, then having something like science research, hospital volunteerism, those things will be helpful. For any BSMD programs, BAMD programs, it is extremely selective, much more selective than any Ivy League admission. Anything you could do to buttress your application through experience with the healthcare industry would be very pivotal. Are, a, B, are AP and IB considered equally by colleges or are you limited to colleges that accept IB? They are viewed equally. They're viewed as college courses, just like any dual enrollment class. So for example, some colleges will have a Syracuse University online course that a student could take in high school. That's viewed as a college level course. Or if you're doing a summer course, maybe this summer you're taking an online summer course, that's viewed as a college level course. So relatively equal. Is there such thing as showing interest? Since there aren't cam campus tours, Okay, so demonstrating interest is so interesting. Before coronavirus, I would say demonstrating interest is huge for a lot of campuses. Demonstrating interest is the idea that you've showcased that you have an interest in the school, and in some way you've proven that, so that your chances are better of getting in. That could be visiting campuses through admission information sessions, campus tour. That could be through interviewing. That could be through joining the mailing list on the admission webpage. I recommend everyone tonight join the admission webpage mailing list of any school you're interested in. And you'll start getting emails from that school or mailing from that school and start reading it. That shows that you're doing research also. Other way to demonstrate interest, maybe the admission rep comes to your high school for a session. So you go to that. It might not happen this fall for a lot of students. So the best way to demonstrate interest is early decision. That shows that you wanna go there if the school offers it. The most selective schools, Brown, Yale, NYU, they couldn't care less about demonstrated interest. They assume if applying, you're interested. A lot of small liberal arts colleges, demonstrated interest is very important. What do BS7D programs look for in their applicants? They look for the top of the top, the cream of the crop, highest scores, highest grades, most impressive extracurricular, strong essays, recommendation letters, and things that are related to the healthcare field. For a legacy, is it important to apply ED? What a great question. Legacy means parent and or grandparent went to a school. Some schools, aunt, uncle, cousin, sibling, but mostly it's parent, grandparent. 
if applying to a school with legacy, your chances in early decision definitely are stronger than Megular because in Megular they wonder, is the student really that interested if they didn't apply ED? Sometimes they wonder, maybe mom or dad made me apply and I don't really want to go here. So it's not the end all be all that you have to do in ED if you're legacy, but definitely your chances are stronger for ED. Next, if you're applying to medical school, what type of medical science volunteer work is best? I would say once things reopen again in society, I hope it happens. Anything in a medical facility of some kind, shadowing a physician, um, candy striper in the hospital, someone who's volunteering in the medical field, science research, if you're able to do that, that looks helpful also. If we take college courses online, how do we list those in our transcript? So that's separate from your high school transcript. That's something you could list on the common application. We'll say list all different colleges you've taken coursework in, and that's where you could list it. Um, you don't have to get a certificate from a college that costs too much dollars. You don't have to worry about that. Other questions? Francis, is there something you want me to cover that I didn't cover? Um, I think like everyone is just, well, if anyone has any questions, I think that would be really helpful. But um, something that I think is really important and time sensitive, what can kids do like right now? Like what can they do today to position themselves in the best light possible in light of what's going on with, you know, the insanity behind the quarantine and the coronavirus and a lot of students, um, I mean, we have so many kids and I'm sure you, you have the same situation where they had multiple summer plans uh, to take place this summer and like none of it, none of it is transpiring. So it, what can they do now to really like shine? Right. So there are a lot of things you could do in the summertime that aren't cost prohibitive. Have you guys heard of edX or I'll put it in the chat or MOOCs? These are places, these are platforms that allow you to take free courses online. That's something that's going to help your application and give you some meaning and something to do. You can learn an instrument for the first time. You can learn a foreign language through getting yourself one of those teach yourself books or doing it online. You can learn how to crochet or knit. I have a student who picked up origami and just became unbelievable in it. Um, don't feel like you have to find the most difficult to attain internship or community service project. Just do something of interest. Um, edX courses, you do not need to buy a certificate. So don't feel like you have to do that. So I think look for things, there's a Yale course on the, well, the science of well-being that's free. Um, there are a lot of things you can do that will help position you for college admissions, but also give you meaning. I think being a voracious reader is huge. If you're not a big reader, become one this summer. So that'll help you for when you go to college one day that you have to read a lot more volume in college than you have to do in high school. Um, schools that do not offer regents, how do colleges view that? So colleges are fine with that. Not every high school offers regent. A lot of private schools are accredited by the New York State Association of Independent Schools and don't require regents. The school where I work is one of those. So colleges are not penalizing kids for going to schools that don't have regents. What kind of questions are asked during an interview? Questions in an interview will be about you, about your school, and about your experience. And tend to be, tends to be the first questions about why do you want to go to this university? So you want to show that you've done research on um, on the school where you're being interviewed. So if you're being interviewed by Brandeis University, you should know about Brandeis before going into that interview. You should know how to talk about yourself, your extracurriculars, your summers, the adjectives that best describe you, the high school that you attend, uh, challenges you faced in high school, what did you do to overcome those challenges, things like that. Is Naviance the end all and be all to know if you'll be accepted? No, here's why. My school uses Naviance. Naviance is this online college counseling platform that a lot of high schools utilize. And I think, Valerie, you might be referring to the scattergrams, which is a good piece of information where you can see where you fall within line. The scattergrams will tell you if you're in the conversation. It won't guarantee your admission. The scattergrams also don't tell you if someone has some type of VIP status or legacy or what type of extracurriculars a student had. They only reveal scores and grades of a history of applications. They also don't reveal the college within the university a student got into. So let's say someone's applying to Cornell. Admission looks different for engineering versus the hotel school versus business versus art and architecture versus liberal arts. It's just the reality. So Naviance is very helpful. It's not the end all be all. A uh, second platform I mentioned before after edX is the idea of going into looking into what MOOCs are. Um, here, I'll put it in here. MOOCs, massive online programs. Um, it's important for you to look into also. Queller Prep Book Club, that's awesome. Join book clubs, yes. 
Um, with early decision or action, pre apply for scholarships? Absolutely. You can apply for merit scholarships either on the, um, the university website if they have merit scholarships or different private ones. I'm going to give you a new website also to check out. There's an organization called Going Merry, which is very helpful. It's almost like a common app for scholarships. So I just heard about it last month. I signed my school up for it. It is amazing, something to consider. Uh, should we mention if we took an edX program or is it for personal benefit? Definitely mention that you did it on the application where it says you can list places where you've taken coursework, you can list it there, and also you can write about it in the additional information section of the application. You've heard that sometimes alumni schedule a pre-interview. That can happen somewhere. Interviews could be with an alum, could be with an admission officer, could be with a senior who works in the admissions office. Sometimes they're in a Starbucks. I don't know what it's going to look like this year. I presume the next few months, any interviews will be on Zoom. Next. What is the feature for the SAT ACT for incoming juniors? A lot of colleges have got test optional in a one year pilot. There are some colleges that have got test optional for two years, and there are some colleges who are permanently test optional. For the most competitive schools, these schools are not test optional just yet for the rising juniors. They're only test optional for the rising seniors. The only reason they'd be test optional for the rising juniors is if in the fall, a bunch of test centers have to cancel and the coronavirus is not going away. So we don't know what the future is going to look like. So that's why for rising juniors, it's a good idea to prepare for standardized testing because also if you have great scores, that can only help out your application. What about kids who are good students but also dedicated athletes with national standing? How can they frame that? Okay, so if you are an athlete and you're applying to the most competitive schools, they're expecting strong athletic achievement to be a recruited athlete and strong academic achievement. That's the reality for student athletes because you're balancing maybe 20 hours a week of practices and games with your academics. So for the more selective schools, we're expecting strength in both academics and athletics. Uh, any tips on getting a nomination for West Point? Check out their admission criteria. It's pretty competitive. Uh, you have to have a local politician recommendation. It, it's pretty all encompassing. You have to be in great physical shape. So see what it is that they look for um, to see if you are gonna be within the parameters for uh, competitive admission. Applying for architecture programs, how do you efficiently prepare portfolios? Great question. So there was something called National Portfolio Day for art programs. I'm not sure what they're gonna do in the fall. If you have an art teacher in your school and you wanna showcase those blueprints, you could do that. Um, but portfolios, you're a little bit more independent, which is a reality of the architecture programs in schools. So you have to be able to put together this and I think the summertime is a great time to do it. Same with studio art. If you have a portfolio, it's required for admission. Good idea to spend the summer doing your uh, your art. The ACT will allow students to retake ACT sections, not this year. They decided that they're not going to allow it for this year. They just announced that about two weeks ago. What I could tell you is that for section retakes, colleges didn't announce that they're okay with it just yet. So for this year ahead, there's no section retakes. You're going to have to take a full ACT anytime you want to test. Is the PSAT helpful besides for national scholarship? What a great question. So PSAT, very high scores, can give you national merit letter of commendation or national merit uh, semifinalist standing. And if you become a semifinalist, you might become a finalist, and then you can advance to get merit scholarships from certain schools. The University of Michigan did not announce test optional. They announced text, test flexible for this year. They recognized that SAT, ACT was canceled. So they're saying if you send us any testing, including PSAT, we can use that to help out your application. They're the only school that has said that so far. For everyone else, the PSAT is not as helpful. Can you explain the process of receiving national scholarships in PSAT? Sure. How it works is the PSAT is out of 1520, so it's 760 per section. And based on your index, some years might be a 1480 and higher, some years 1460, depends on the year. You might qualify for national merit semifinalist standing, in which case the PSAT and MSQT will send you the mailing to tell you about that qualification. You fill out an application that involves an essay, and that can be the same essay you'll use for your common app. And then you can advance to finalist standing. You'll list the different schools that are of interest to you, and those are the schools you're applying to. And if you end up attending a school that you listed you're interested in, and that school partners with the PSAT, you can get a few thousand dollars from Merit Scholarship. How much will SAT subject test matter this year? If you're a rising senior, you're in good luck. It's not going to matter as much. Uh, really high scores can only help, but not having scores will not hurt you. Can doing test prep for SAT help you prepare for PSAT? Yes. So um, PSAT comes first. So whether you take it as a sophomore and or junior, 
um, test prep can only be helpful. Other questions? Francis, do you want to get on the line if you have any questions for me? Yep, just one second. Guys, do you have any questions? Michael, do you mind just sharing more information about yourself? Hopefully that'll generate some questions. I just want them to know your expertise as we're okay. working on this. Okay. Yeah. Yes, you're, you're currently at a camp, is that correct? Or where you're- Yeah, you're... I work at a sleepaway camp in Pennsylvania that's open. I know it's the beginning of my intro, but a lot of people may have come later. I am director of college counseling at SCR High School. It's a private school in Riverdale, New York. I've been there 13 years. So I've seen thousands of essays and advised hundreds of thousands of kids at this point in the college admission process. Before that, I worked at New York University at the Office of Undergraduate Admissions, where I worked at the College of Arts and Science and Stern School of Business Committee. I used to work in the sports industry back in the day. So fun fact, I used to work for the NFL. I used to work for NBC Olympics in Athens. Um, so that's part about my past. Um, so some of the more challenging discussions around the admissions table, that's a great question. When I was doing the admission for Stern School of Business, there were far more competitive applicants than there were actual admission seats. And that's the case with Ivy League schools. The admission rep for Columbia once said when they were at an 8% admit rate, now they're at a 5%. When they were at an 8%, they said 80% of our pool is admissible. 80% of our pool can do the work here. And yet we're only taking 8%. So what's very difficult is denying or waitlisting kids who really are compelling and could do the work there. That's just a matter of seats. So it's really getting to the nitty gritty of those essays and extracurricular activities and recommendation letters and really seeing if a student is a good fit for the school. Having the scores and grades is just the initial entry. It's just the cards to play poker. It doesn't mean you win the hand. And you win the hand based on all the other factors. Questions about the NYU Grossman School of Admissions and free tuition. So NYU Medical School is different from NYU undergraduate. Going to NYU for undergrad does not guarantee admission to NYU Medical School by any stretch of the imagination. Going to NYU undergrad might allow you to establish connections with the medical school professionals because you might enter at the hospital uh, or meet professors that could sit in the admission committee for medical school, but there is no combined program. What are some of the most outstanding essays you reviewed? Oh, what a great question. I've received so many thousands of good ones. This year, I have a student who's going to the University of Chicago who wrote about Century Village, which is an elderly community in South Florida where his grandparents live and how he just didn't fit in. It was very out of the box, something I hadn't seen. And it was hilarious. So that was a great essay. I read an essay about a student who um, studied these ancient biblical texts that are typically reserved for men in their 40s and older, and she's 15. And how she once was studying one in the subway, and these people who were discussing the texts were confused about something, and she as a 15-year-old interceded and told them the answer. That was a unique essay. I have a student who did theater with senior citizens, and he wrote about the experience once where a senior citizen had to basically denude him, not physically, but like had to eviscerate him and talk about his background, how, how privileged he is, and he wrote about that experience. I mean, there's many different things. It's not something I can give you advice on. It's really your experience and your story that'll make a great essay. Uh, when you have such high competition for seats, what often are determining factors that edge out one applicant from another? So as I was talking about before, the separation factor. How do you separate from a pack of thousands? What is it about your passions and the way you've pursued them that gives you a compelling story that maybe they wouldn't see elsewhere? That's what you need to consider. That's what's your story and how is your story different from so many other people? A question from privately asked, is sophomore year the earliest you can take PSAT for purpose of getting into national merit? No, you can only get national merit for your junior year scores, not your sophomore year. Sophomore year is good practice, but national merit is only based on the junior year. How can we go about dealing with college rejections? It seems devastating to put in all this work to get into our dream colleges to possibly re be rejected. I don't know, that's a great question. Good news about the United States of America is there are thousands of amazing colleges. There is not just one school where you're gonna be happy. That's the reality. I had a student last year who was desperate to get into University of Delaware. She did not get in. She got into her second choice, Syracuse University, and this year she said to me, I cannot imagine going anywhere but Syracuse. It's gonna happen, you're gonna get rejected very possibly in life, whether it's from a significant other, whether it's from college admission, grad school admission, a job. And this is all part of the growing up and maturation process. You're allowed to cry, you're allowed to be sad, but you shouldn't get depressed over it because there's gonna be so many other places that's gonna make you very happy and they're gonna want you. 
if you overreach, which means you're only thinking of the IVs and there's no quote safety school that you're interested in, you might be disappointed. You have to have these safety level schools that you're excited about and not just think I have to go to a school that's ranked top 10 in US News and World Report. Um, share a fact about admissions that would shock all of us. I would think, hmm, this is gonna sound so crazy. Francis, you ready for this? There's, so, nothing, there's nothing you could do about this, but an admission reader might read your application at 7 p.m. They might read your application at 9 a.m. They are fresher at 9 a.m. It's just a reality. They are more fatigued at 7 p.m. And you can't account for it. There's nothing you could do. So the best thing you could do is put together the best application you can, the strongest essays, the most compelling way you list your activities. So that this way, that person who's read 50 applications earlier that day isn't just exhausted and cranky. How shocking is that? I think it's shocking. Uh, next, what about applying to a less competitive college than a university? For example, instead of engineering, apply to arts and sciences, then transfer to engineering. That is a strategy that a lot of people do espouse. My one caveat is that wherever you're gonna be for freshman year before internally transferring, you have to be okay with that curriculum. So if you're someone who wants to go from, let's say, liberal arts to business or liberal arts to engineering, you have to be okay with a lot of liberal arts classes freshman year and not delving into those pure business classes or engineering classes that those students would take in their freshman year. How competitive is it to get into Harvard's dual degree music programs at the New England Conservatory? Any idea? Anything with the name Harvard is going to be competitive. Anything with conservatory is going to be competitive. Anything with Harvard and conservatory is going to be competitive too. Uh, how helpful are summer gifted programs to competitive admissions like Duke, Johns Hopkins, Columbia Summer Immersion? Those are great. Those aren't as impressive as things that you do during the school year. Colleges are more impressed by balancing academics with extracurriculars in the school year than they are with anything you're doing in the summer. So yes, it looks good and it's wonderful. It's not the end all be all. Should I reschedule the SAT subject test, ACT? You should if you think you could do a lot better and you think you can score above the curve of the middle 50% to give your score a nice look on the application. If I decide during my freshman year of college that it's a bad fit, do you know what admission looks like for a college freshman? I think you mean a transfer student. If you're not happy freshman year, you can always apply to transfer. What I would tell you is don't say I need to transfer after two weeks. You need to give a college at least that one semester of the best chance. My colleague once said this advice, I think it's brilliant. Freshman year, when everyone comes home Thanksgiving and says how happy they are, all your friends are lying. A lot of people are still finding their identity, discovering who are their friends versus the acquaintance. They're navigating the roommate situation. You shouldn't feel like you're a failure if you're not happy the first two months of college. It's very normal. Transfer admission is based on retention. So if you're applying to a school that has a very strong retention, getting in as a transfer is gonna be difficult. So transfer admission, they look at the college staff. They also look at your high school statistics and forming an opinion. And that's why getting involved in extracurriculars in college will be helpful also to add to your story. How is beneficial is going to undergrad at Ivy League colleges compared to any other, in medicine specifically? I would say the most selective schools, it's most important for going into Wall Street, going into engineering. For going into med school, law school, the terminal degree matters most, medical degree, the law degree. So if you go to an undergraduate school that might not be as prestigious sounding, but you get a 4.0 and you're getting involved in internships and research, and you have great recommendations from professors and you're a student leader on campus, if you have high MCATs, you'll get into a strong medical school. If you have high LSATs, you'll get into a strong law school. So you shouldn't feel like the undergraduate branding matters as much if you know you're for sure going to graduate school after college. <coughs> um, do you think vocal extroverts have a benefit over introverts in the admission process? It's a great question. The colleges are looking for leaders and sometimes the extroverts are stronger leaders, but an introvert may be a stronger writer. An introvert may have a more compelling uh, story based on their community service that they've been doing. I think in life, sometimes extroverts might have a benefit and those introverts need to learn how to speak up and advocate for themselves. You can still be an introvert personality wise, but when it comes to advocating for yourself in an interview, you'll need to know how to do that. And I think the college admission process is a good skill and a good entry point. Next questions. Um, any reason to take the PSAT besides national merit? If you've already have high scores and standardized tests, there, there's no reason for it. Um, does PSAT in 10th grade count for anything, even putting you in college radar? No, it might get you on marketing materials, but it doesn't get you into colleges. It might just put you on their marketing list, but it doesn't get you into the school. Um, schools do not require the essay section of SAT, ACT. So someone here wrote many verses required, it's just not the case. 
colleges just do not care about the essay section anymore. If you're a really strong writer and you want to showcase that, you're welcome to, but do not stress about the essay section of the SAT. ACT colleges do not care about it anymore. Uh, my son's school has not provided GPA grades. What do schools do? Colleges will re recalculate the grades and create their own GPA and their own scale. So if your school does not have a GPA system, your student is not going to be negatively impacted as a result. Is it better to take online programs now that are geared towards the major I intend to do? Something you could think about, you don't have to. Uh, colleges are expecting students to have a strong high school education in English, history, math, science, foreign language. You don't have to have all the different classes and all the different majors that you're considering. Um, if you want to take an ancient Greek course, you're welcome to. But you shouldn't feel like you have to do that for everything that you might want to study in college one day. What happens if you're accepted to school early admission but unable to attend because of finances? So you're not going to be arrested. You're not going to be held to a contract. But that only should happen if you did your legwork before and the college gave you much less than you expected them to give you. How about Canadian universities like Toronto, McGill? Great question, Vera. Canadian universities, European system also, it's not going to matter as much with the holistic review, extracurriculars, essays, recommendation letters. They care really about scores and grades. And based on those parameters, you'll see on their website, it'll list what are the scores you need for McGill Faculty of Arts? What are the scores you need for McGill Faculty of Engineering? So it's a little bit more formulaic. Um, is it worth putting competitive score, uh, sport on the application, even if it's not necessarily for a recruit athlete? Yes, absolutely. It's an extracurricular of interest. How is NYU admission process different from other colleges? I would say NYU and other schools that have the multiple undergraduate universities are a bit more similar. Cornell, Boston University, Penn, WashU. Uh, but it's going to feel different than a school that's just a small liberal arts college where you're just being admitted into the college and not a college within the university. Okay. Um, for edX, you don't need to buy a certificate in order for it to count. So don't worry about paying a few hundred dollars at the end of the course. Um, someone wrote here, Microsoft, said, Microsoft says they'll move to skills-based job descriptions, no college degree required. I can tell you that the college degree is still very valuable in the workforce, especially in more white collar fields. You will see some prodigies who will work for Google or Microsoft or Amazon based on their skill level. That's not the norm, that's more the exception especially this generation right now. We'll see where the future leads, but right now they're still looking for a college degree for the most part. NYU Poly, you're talking about NYU Tandon School of Engineering, it used to be called Poly. Same tuition, yes, and application requirements, yes, but they're looking more for math and science. So for NYU, it's called the NYU Tandon School of Engineering. It's now one of the schools within NYU, just like Stern School of Business, Tisch School of the Arts, Gallatin School of Individualized Study, etc. What would be considered strong SAT scores? Depends on the school you're applying to. The idea is that some schools of 1400 will give you merit scholarship. For some schools of 1400, you're not even close to the middle 50%. So it depends on the school. Uh, for instance, I'm seeing 31 more messages. I might not get to all of them. I'll get to as many as I can though. Um, is it okay to take the actual SAT in 10th grade? Yes, you don't have to wait till 11th or 12th. If you're strong enough in 10th and you have the score you need, you're done, that's fine. For colleges with multiple schools, like Cornell, does it look bad to apply to multiple schools? No, you can only apply to one school within the university, unless they're giving you a choice to list a second choice. So for Cornell, you're applying to the university, and you're applying to the college within Cornell, let's say College of Agriculture and Life Sciences, and the major within that college. So in the case of the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences, you might be applying to um, a biology and society major. So you're looking to see that you're a good match for the school, the major, and the university as a whole. Does it matter where the high school you are from when applying to college? Yeah, I mean, the high school you go to, you might have an admission counselor has a relationship with your school's counselor. It could be there's a history of applications there. But if you're applying from a school, this college has never seen an application, the college will get something called the school profile to see what the school has to offer and how you're doing within that curriculum. Great questions, yes. Um, do colleges care about extracurriculars or any impressive activities you have done before high school time? No, they only care about nine through 12. Uh, talk about steps for medical school. Medical school entails bio, chem, organic chemistry, and physics, one year of each with a semester of calculus. You could do that with a bio major or a chem major or a physics major. You could do that with an English major or a history major or a journalism major. They're looking for strong MCATs, strong grades, strong extracurriculars, research, internships, etc. And it's going to be very competitive to get into medical school. It's just the reality of the system. Question about major switching. We apply for an easier major to get into, like theater, and then transfer to a desired major. 
theater is not an each year major. If there's an audition, it's actually a lot more competitive. But the idea is that internal transfer is very feasible for a lot of schools, but you want to apply to the school within the university where you're going to be happy freshman year. I've had students apply to Penn for College of Arts and Sciences because they didn't want to go to Penn Nursing. Even though Penn Nursing isn't as selective as Arts and Sciences, they saw the freshman year curriculum and realized, I really don't want this. I want to go to medical school. So you have to make sure you go to the right school within the university where you'll be happy academically. Uh, with all the negative publicity, or legacies even valued more anymore? Yes, they're absolutely valued. I think what you're referring to is a varsity blues scandal of Rory Lachlan and Felicity Huffman. That wasn't legacy, that was development. So legacies are still considered important. With Harvard and their bad press they've gotten, it's not because of legacy, it's because of the discrimination against a certain population that was really awful. It had nothing to do with legacy specifically. Um, major achievement in one area versus well-rounded in many areas, which is better? I would say it's something in the middle. It's better to have a few commitments, not just one, but not 10. So it's, there's three to four things that you've done multiple years, multiple hours a week with leadership. That's the ideal, it's that middle area. Scholarship process, I went to start applying. You can look now into scholarships. I would say whether you're a rising sophomore, junior, senior, um, that is something you consider really now. Um, I would say that going Mary website is very helpful. That's something you could start working on now, even before applying to schools, because you shouldn't start considering schools only in senior year based on scholarships. You should start doing research beforehand. Parents, it's very important to have a conversation with your kids about finances way before applying and not after being admitted somewhere that you can't afford. Uh, it's very important to say, here's our reality. We can't afford more than this number for college. We can try to do everything we can to reach that number. We can't go above that number. So if a school sticker price is 75000 and parents say we can only afford 45000 a student shouldn't try to do loans for the other 30000 They should try to find other ways to get scholarships to make that school work and not loans. Experience with homeschool students. So school admissions view them compared to public or private school. So basically for homeschool students, testing is very important because the transcript is a little bit more subjective than it would be at a high school. So standardized testing will play a bigger role. Do you have a better chance with a school where a large group from high schools get accepted every year? Yeah, if there's a reputation from a certain high school, but that's the one side. The other side is you might have more competition applying to that school. I heard that private universities are more generous than financially than most public universities. Will this be true even with low funding and widespread unemployment? Private universities with large endowments are more generous than financial aid. Private universities with lower endowments aren't as generous. In-state publics will still be the best buy, whether it's CUNY or SUNY, for example. Out of state publics will be the hardest. They want your tuition dollars. They're not going to give you a ton of merit money. And the private schools tend to have the money to try their best to reach your financial need. Which area in your application will you add an explanation for making a class pass fail, receiving a bad grade in a test? That will be the additional information section within the writing part of the application. Will 5% Native American and DNA test be count as Native American application? Yes, you can list the ethnicities that you feel best you identify with in your application within the demographic section. When do you suggest one should start working with a college counselor and start formulating their application? I think second semester junior year is the best time to really start looking in earnest at the process. And then August of senior year, you're full speed ahead. You're ready to go. So guys, these were great questions. Thank you so much. Uh, Francis likes to do a, uh, a true false game with me at the end. So Francis, do you want to do that now? So everyone, I want I want to just thank everyone, and let's and I wanted to say huge thank you to Michael Courtney for this amazing amazing Zoom info session that we're having. So I do have a whole bunch of questions that I'm going to torpedo away. I just want to look them up quickly because I have them in my notes file. And in the meantime, can you guys just write a very nice thank you to Michael Courtney for all these questions? So and for this time, and I really appreciate the setting. I realize that you're not at home and you really just made it work. So I think that we should all give you a huge, gigantic thank you. Um, I'm going to ask a couple of questions. Ready? I'm going to pretend that I am a high school student and I know everything, everything. Ready? Question, and, we're going to, and you're going to tell me if I'm right or if I'm wrong, if this is fact or if this is fiction. Okay, everyone, are you ready? We're listening in. Ready? Good. I'm not sure. Mike, do you see me on the camera or am I on a video? I just see the Queller Prep logo, but it's okay. Oh, okay, just because I, I can't look at the questions and do both, but it's okay, fine. Everyone, pay attention. Ready? I'm pretending that I am 16. I know everything. Okay, ready? Mike, I'm not going to think about college until I'm in the 12th grade. There's no point in thinking about it. I'm going to wait until I'm in the 12th grade to think about college. Go. 
Great question. So that used to be the case maybe 30 years ago and before. I would say the admission process is a lot more early now. Uh, you have to plan an action, have a plan of action for a standardized test calendar, for example, freshman year grades count. So as a freshman, you don't have to think of college per se. We should think of how your grades are important. I would say sophomore year, you start thinking about it a little more because of the testing ahead and getting involved in extracurriculars. Junior year really becomes a lot more all-encompassing. Ready, everyone? I am the 16-year-old. I know everything. Mike, I do not want to take SAT 2s if I'm taking AP classes. Why should I take SAT 2 bio if I'm taking AP bio? Bio, bio, schmayo. So the subject test will matter more than the AP results. So I would say that if you're considering standardized testing and you have great proficiency in a certain subject, you're an AP bio, honors bio, taking that subject test, getting the mid-700s or higher can only help you. I am going to apply early decision to six different colleges because early decision is my easy way to get in. I can have slightly lower grades. ED, six schools. Ha, 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 ha. So your high school only send a transcript to one school for ED. So you can't try to game the system and apply to multiple. Same with the final transcript or every deposit. The only deposit, the only send your transcript to one school. My plan is to pay someone to write my college application. So let's talk. There are people out there who do that. This is your voice and the application should come through from a 17, 18 year old and not from someone who is significantly older who is doing everything for you. It's good to get advice from people. You don't want to ask 10 people to read your college essay. You'll get 10 different opinions. Your school counselor and an English teacher are enough. But I would say when it comes to your application, this is your time to be an adult and to really grow up and not count on others doing everything for you. I am going to send fake scores to colleges. Colleges are busy. They have quite a lot going on. I'm just going to pretend that I got fives on all of my APs and 800s on all of my SAT2 subject tests. That's a great point. So how it works is you could self-report scores on an application and list what you got. But you then need to substantiate those scores by sending the official documentation to your colleges from the SAT website or from the ACT website. So you really can't list fake scores. My plan is to take the easiest math classes possible and get straight A's. So when colleges see that I took math, they're going to see that I'm an A student. Right. So they're expecting you to take a nice curricular document from a curricular um, stepping from algebra to geometry to pre-calc to AP-calc and not just pre-algebra, pre-pre-algebra, pre-pre-pre-algebra. I would like to do extra recommendation letters. Specifically, my grandma, my Bobby, she loves me so much. She could write pages and pages and pages about me. And my plan is to have grandma write my application letters. What do you think, guys? So applications, I'm sorry, recommendation letters from family will never suffice. I've seen plenty of applications over the years from a politician who doesn't even know the kid, just knows the mom or dad. So it really needs to be someone who knows you in the context of a way that's going to help your application, I'm not just trying to name, name, uh, name drop people that you know. Ready? After I'm accepted and after I get into the school of my choice, I am going to tell all the teachers what I really think of them. And I hate them all. Every single last one I ever had. I'm going to put it in writing and let them know the truth. So karma's tough because it's going to come back to bite you. You might need that teacher recommendation letter for an internship one day or for a transfer application. And they also have your final grades of senior year as an important element of the application process because you have to maintain the same academic standards to keep your seat. So don't be rude to your teachers. Actually, send them thank you notes instead. I don't want to do the SAT plus writing. I don't want to do the ACT plus writing. I don't want to write. And Queller, I think you're just trying to make some more money. Don't make me write. I really don't want to write. So that's interesting. Writing does not matter anymore. However, if you're a really strong writer, why not? It can only help. If you're a really poor writer, I don't think you're all of a sudden going to get a 12 on the essay. But if you're someone who's a good to great writer, it can't hurt. My plan is to only do the, you know, required parts of the college application. Optional, optional. I'm not doing it. It's too much work. It says optional. Do you know what optional means? It means I don't have to do it. So I tell this to my students all the time, but there are sections of the application that will be optional. And I'll say to them that admission folks are expecting someone to write that. Why else would they put it in? So let that someone be you. My plan is to pay full price to college. I'm going to get into Harvard. Sorry, mom. You got to pay top dollar. I'm going. It's interesting because different families can afford different figures. So if your family can easily afford a full price, God bless. That's wonderful. And your kids should thank you profusely. If families can only afford a certain amount and the student has to take out loans, 
federal government does not recommend more than $18,000 of loans over the course of four years. So they shouldn't be taking out 20,000 a year. It should be maybe four to 5,000 a year. My dream is to go to medical school. Medical schools wanna see AP classes. Forget physics, forget chem, forget AP bio, forget that. I'm gonna take AP garbage. And you know what? That is gonna get me into medical school, BAMD 2021. So to get into combined medical, you have to have the highest level of rigor for the sciences. To get into medical school post-college, you have to have those biochem, organic chemistry, physics classes just to be in the conversation. My plan is to lie about my race. And there, I'm done. I can work around that. That's a bad precedent to send for your life because you want to always be honest when it comes to things that could come back to bite you. Um, dean of Admissions at MIT was a long time, long tenure Dean of Admissions. And she had to resign in scandal about a decade ago because she lied about stuff in her resume. You don't want to be that person. I'm going to create a social, uh, while, you know, I'm getting really angry lately in social media and I want to vent. I want to voice my frustration. And I want to say that I hate people. I want to specifically refer to people I hate and I want to post it online. Is that going to hurt my application? Yeah, it's not a good idea to be a cyber bully, just like it wouldn't be a good idea to be a bully in real life. Anything that you post on the internet is searchable for a long time. So if you're going to write anything that's going to come across as hateful speech or not accepting of others, you're going to really harm yourself. The college application says 650 words for the Common App. I'm going to write 650,000 words. Yeah, if you, try you to go, if you try to go over 650, it's just going to cut you off, so you can't. I would say that the minimum would be about 500. It says in the application 250 to 650. I think 275 is just too low, but anywhere in the 500 to 650 is good. My plan is to stalk the admissions office of the colleges I apply to. I will smother them. I will email them. I will call them. I will text them. I will chat with them. I will do nothing. They will know my voice. And you know what? I'll be so annoying. They have to accept me. So just like a celebrity doesn't want to be stalked by a potential fan, so to admission folks don't want to be stalked by a potential applicant. Everyone, I want to give you a huge, gigantic thank you for listening to this. It was uh, from 7.30 to 9 o'clock straight. We didn't even take a break. I want to just say gigantic thank you. If all of you are able to maybe go off mute, say thank you. And you can also write thank you into the chat box. Um, thank you for being a part of this. And it, we, it really means a lot to us that you are a part of this. Michael Courtney, um, it is an honor to know you for 20 years. Um, and, uh, you know, I almost want to laugh thinking that when we first started these, who would have ever thought this would be on Zoom, number one. But when we first started this, um, I used to actually interrupt all the time. Those of you who know me know that I do that. I actually, I let you speak. And I want you to know that that comes after years of knowing that I trust what you say. I respect what you say. Thank you for being so knowledgeable. Thank you for finally letting me speak at the end and for really just giving your whole heart of time. And uh, I really want to say no matter where, what location you're in and where you are, it just means so much that you're here, that you're doing this. Um, and uh, I, I guess Goldie's going to do a cameo. Let's do that. Can I get, let me get Goldie. And um, I do want to say thank you. I want to remind you guys, we have a lot of exciting things going on for Queller Prep. So we're running the book club, which is going to be great. We, here's Goldie. Do, 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 Goldie. We're running the book club, which is going to be great. Um, we're, there are a lot of things at Queller Prep that are changing for the better. So I do want to share that with you. We're, we've already started a middle states accreditation, I believe, you know, within the year to try to get credited programs at Queller Prep. We're going to work on a homeschool. Mike, can you spotlight me? Is that, I'm trying to figure out how to do that and it's not quite working, but, um, so anyway, so we're working on the, thank you. Hi, everybody. Look at how blue we are. Um, so we are working on, hello, Goldie. Goldie, thank you, Michael Courtney. Hi, we're working in the Goldie. Middle States. Hi, Goldie. We're working in Middle States Accreditation. I signed up for the Independent Schools Association. And I, we've retained a lawyer and an education consultant to help with the Queller Homeschool Co-op. So we have all sorts of ideas that we're going to be executing in the months ahead. The homeschool co-op is probably the most immediate middle states accreditation. I, I can tell you estimated timeline about a year from now, we will have the accreditation. We're, we're in the process. There are a lot of cool things coming up. So you'll get the emails with it. Um, I do want to thank all the families for the support of our tutoring program. We have 700 kids on Zoom right now, and there are about 100 across the two tutoring centers. And 
we would never be able to do this without all the support that comes from the parents and the kids and the guardians. And it means a lot. There's a lot of effort to make everything so successful um, at Queller and we're working on it. So hopefully we're gonna keep building. My best advice to you is think of what you can do to make a positive change right now, given you know the limitations and all the restrictions that you have. So what can you do to make a positive impact try, try really, really hard to do that. And, you know, maybe it's even a webinar or something like this, but something that will put you in a light where you feel good. You really do like feel good doing something good. I'm, I'm telling you the truth. All right. And something that's going to give you good energy. So keep that in mind. Um, and then just remember that we're going to offer at Queller, we're offering regions prep, SAT2 prep. We're going to have a lot of little mini prep courses at Queller and then lengthier ones. And um, please stay tuned for the homeschool co-op. We're going to have that this weekend. Thank you guys. Thank you for listening. And um, that's it. Thank you for all your amazing questions. You guys did a great job. And um, Michael, Courtney, la I know I said thank you 10 times, 12. I'm going to say it 15. Thank you for doing this from a summer camp headquarter in Pennsylvania. Like I really, I cannot thank you enough. You really could have said no and you didn't. So it speaks volumes that you made it work. Um, and you made the internet work and you made the sound. I think we had excellent sound also given the circumstances. Like, thank you for just making this work. It means a lot. It means a lot to the kids. There were about a hundred kids who logged into this. If any of you guys want to go off the mute, if you're able to, I don't know if you could, I hope so. But if you're able to go off mute and just say thank you, that would be really good. If you can't go off mute, I'm not sure about the settings, but if you're able to go off mute do so if thank not, you type thank you thank oh perfect you. thank you okay. thank you everyone thank you. let's say thank you thank, thank you, you guys let's thank say you thank, you. Thank, you. thank you michael courtney thank you thank you thank you so much thank you thank you thank you so much thank you thank you guys thank you for this amazing opportunity and for listening all right and we're all set thank you thank you guys all right, and we're gonna have a few more really good webinars coming up down the road. And this is important. It's, it's also, I think, an important element of all of our mental health right now, collectively speaking, that we're all together, even though not physically together, we are together and we're one community of people who are learning and trying to move up and ahead. Very big deal that you know we come together in any way that we can. So I think we're good. I really liked all the questions from the chat. I'm actually gonna screenshot some of these because they were so good as we're logging yeah. off. All right, thank you guys. And if you're able to, um, you can always email us some feedback so that we have it, okay? Thank you guys. That's it guys, Any anything else? Any? I, I guess we're done, we're done. I'm gonna head out, okay? Thank you guys, huge thank you. You guys can log out. I'm just gonna take a few screenshots of the chat because um, the questions were very good and I wanna actually just have them as a record. So just to make sure we covered all the questions. All right, thank you guys. Bye bye everybody. We will see you again soon. All right, I'm taking a few more. Let me see my chat photos. Anyway, so many questions. Good night. So many questions. All right, hold on guys, I'm going. <sighs> There are a lot of questions in the chat. Maybe I'll take one more with the group. All right, I'm logging off. Okay, bye everybody. Thank you. Are you going to do it again? So much. Do you think Am you'll I do it? Yeah. This, this particular one? Yeah, I mean, we do it like every month or so. So we'll do it again. We shall. Okay. Okay. We, shall. we, repeat, we repeat it fairly often. Um, I, I'm going to see how you know, good the recording is. We're likely going to post to YouTube. I'll, I'll check on it. But it, it's likely going to happen. I'm going to check on the recording once it uploads. Okay? Okay. Thanks. And um, we will every month, I hope. I mean, we, 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 these are pretty frequent. Okay? Thank you, guys. Thanks for listening. Thank you.